What's going on, Ambitious Vet? Welcome to episode number 62 of the Ambitious Vet Show with United States Marine veteran, American dog training, and canine educational expert at Camis and Canines, and co-host of Rescue Dog to Super Dog on Animal Planet, Nate Schomer. Welcome to the Ambitious Vet, where we believe if you desire more, you have to become more. My name is Chris Hoffman, Marine Combat Veteran turned Passion Driven Entrepreneur. On this show, I dive into the trenches with today's top military veteran thought leaders and influencers who know what it takes to not only pay the bills after the military, but really make an impact. You're going to hear their stories, failures, and golden grenades to empower you to execute on what matters most in your life right now. Are you looking to create time and money freedom after making the needed sacrifice to fight for our freedoms? Want to be your own boss? Tired of the same old, highly routine, structured life with no time, freedom, or money? Freedom in sight? A career is not your only option after transitioning from the military. In fact, 45% of veterans who get out start their own business only to fail two years later due to the lack of business education and direction. Sound familiar? Well, ready to narrow the learning curve and risk by plugging into a proven business process and system that creates the lifestyle you desire most after serving our great nation? The Veteran Franchise Group has your back. As military veteran franchise brokers, they mentor and provide their veteran clients with industry data, science-based entrepreneur personal assessments for effective matchmaking, company data, and the resources needed from their portfolio of over 500 franchise opportunities to empower you to choose and start the next chapter in your life as a franchise business owner. Simply just visit veteransfranchisegroup.com to schedule your free strategy call today. Again, that's veteranfranchisegroup.com to schedule your free strategy call today. Ambitious Vet, just welcome to another episode of the Ambitious Vet. As always, I just want to start out by thanking you. If you weren't here listening to this week after week, or if you're one of those like me sometimes that falls behind and goes back and uh, kind of just binges off my favorite podcast, either or whoever you are, I just want to thank you for coming in on you know this week and listening to this episode. I think you're going to get a lot out of this high speed Marine Corps veteran Nate Schomer. So without further ado, let's go ahead and just dive into the introduction, okay? Nate Schomer is an American dog training and canine educational expert and former United States Marine. After graduating from the Tom Rose School at the top of his class, Nate embarked on his entrepreneurial goals in the canine world. This included the creation of Heroes Legacy, a nonprofit educational foundation to improve the lives of dogs and their owners. Afterward, Nate was cast as the co-host of Rescue Dog to Super Dog on Animal Planet, skyrocketing his exposure into that of a public figure. Since the show concluded, Nate closed Heroes Legacy to join forces with Camis and Canines. This is a nonprofit that assists veterans and dogs alike, moving operations to the nonprofit's large ranch outside of San Diego. Now, most recently, Nate launched his brand of highly nutritious, freeze dried raw dog food known as On Season Canine Nutrition. Now, lastly, he created an online dog training course that is available on Nate Schomer Dog Training.com. Again, that's Nate Schomer Dog Training. Dot com guys I'm, I'm excited if you're listening to this uh, no matter where you're at um, all across the world um, you know this was a great um, episode I mean he goes dives into his eight years as a United States Marine and how he went from shitbag Shomer which we all know that feeling being in a burger platoon um, in in Marine Corps boot camp to actually being in the fleet becoming a, a shit hot Shomer um, and actually having high demand for his skill sets, his performance and stuff like that. So I don't know who's listening to this right now that has been known to deal with a lot of adversity and obstacles, no matter if you're in the uniform or still just currently getting out of it or you've been out for years. Where are you feeling like you need to bridge that gap? He does a really good job on how he articulated how to bridge the gap from going from a guy that was like known as a shit bag to really becoming a shit hot Marine. He talks about how he got out, got into computer graphics, only to find out that that wasn't really what his passion was. Made a lot of money, 
but really wasn't what he was passionate about and pivoted to a brand new industry with brand new skill sets and all that and really built up a global brand as a dog trainer. We go into the psychology of success, how the power of not assuming things and how that can actually lead to um, chaos and disruption and affects our decision making and all that good stuff. And uh, there's a lot more in here. I could go on and on, but if you don't already have a pen and paper, you don't have your notepad app on your phone, pull it out. There's going to be tons of golden grenades in this one. Without, without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into the trenches with Nate Schomer. Nate, brother, are you there? I am. Thank you so much for having me on your show, brother. I appreciate it. Oh, man. From one Marine to the other, man. Super Fidelis. We're honored to have you. Yeah, and that introduction was pretty nice, too. I appreciate taking the time. Yeah, of course, brother. So go ahead and fill the gaps of that introduction, man. Let us know a little about something personal that we don't know about Nate yet, man. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, well, I mean, it all started when I joined the Marine Corps. So growing up, I was the type of kid who was constantly getting into trouble, ditching school, sneaking out of school, doing things I shouldn't have been doing, and I really didn't have a path. Mm-hmm. And I knew that I wanted to be in the military. So I figured I wanted to join the best one. And I went straight to the Marine Corps. Yes. Signed up. <laughs> and I signed up um, summer of 2001. So right mm-hmm. before the events of 9-11. And it was pretty funny when that happened. Not funny that that happened, but what my recruiter did. So I came in and my recruiter says, hey, man, with everything going on right now, we need to get more troops on the ground. So they're offering a program where you can go right now finish your high school education in the Marine Corps and we'll get you in, in the front of the lines as quickly as possible. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, wow, I don't know if I can do this. I said, do I have some time where I could think about this? And he says, I need to know right now. And I said, okay, let's do it. And so he said, excellent. So he starts getting all this paperwork and stuff together. He puts it in front of me and he says, I need you to sign right here. And I said, well, okay, I need to see what I'm signing. He goes, no, I, we don't have that. Just sign the paperwork. And then when I lifted it up in big, bold print, it said, I am a complete jackass. He was playing a uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He actually did it to another guy, and the other guy quit his job and had to go back and say, oh, my recruiter was just joking. Oh, my gosh. Wow, man. I mean, that, that's, a lot, that's a lot of pressure for being, you know, that young and just, like, being ambitious, wanting to go in the core but not finishing your education. I mean, that kind of had to be a little bit like, whoa, what do I do, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, he kind of put me on the spot, but it was a prank. So, you know, I finished the rest of the school year. I, I graduated. Two days after that, I was in boot camp. And when I first got to boot camp, I was really excited because it looked just like Full Metal Jacket. <laughs> this is awesome. It looks just like the movies. And then, unfortunately, though, I was in Booger Platoon. Hmm. So I was in the worst. <laughs> after we were losing everything. I mean, you know what the Booger Platoon is for those out there that are not in the Marine Corps, Booger Platoon is, it's just the worst platoon in the company, the one that is losing at everything. And I remember I, I became really demotivated and I turned into, they started to call me Shipbag Shomer. Oh, man. And I got to the fleet. And when I got to the fleet, I quickly earned the reputation. Shipbag Shomer continued with me. And I got my ass kicked pretty much every single day. My, mm. my senior Marines, I mean, we were getting ready to go out into combat. And here I am still being shipbag Shomer. And so the amount of pressure that was put on me, I decided at some point, you know what, it's, it's not good for me. It's not good for my unit. It's not good for my team, my squad to be shipbag Shomer. I need to turn this around. And I've heard some of the other vets on your uh, show here, when they get back from being overseas, they have that principle of comparison. They're able to look at what others have in third world countries, more specifically that they're struggling with, and to come back and realize we have it pretty good here. We don't have a reason to complain. We need to work and we need to put forth something of value, not just to ourselves, but to our community. We know it's about we, it's not about me. Mm. And so when I got back after my first deployment, I said, that's it. It's I'm not being shitbag Shomer anymore. (laughs) I refuse to be shitbag Shomer. So I started to do everything and anything that I could. I told myself, I'm never going to have somebody again tell me to do something because I'm going to do it before I'm told. So I started to do that, and I quickly earned the nickname Shit Hot Shomer. Oh, man. That's a switch, man. Come on now. That's <laughs> actually, come on. All right. 
it was it was cool. It went from shit back Shomer to shit hot Shomer. And I remember it was a few of the Marines in my unit who were saying, man, I want Shomer as my gunner because I was a machine gunner. I want Shomer as my gunner. I want Shomer as my gunner. And that really boosted up my my personal confidence and made me want to try even harder. Yeah. And I ended up, you know, I was a private first class for a long time. I ended up receiving Lance Corporal, and then I was meritoriously promoted to Corporal. Then I ended up being a squad leader. I did another combat deployment into Iraq. And again, having that that principle of comparison really makes other day-to-day things seem much easier. I remember Corporal told me when I was a private first time I was in Iraq, he says, everything after this is going to be easy if you can compare it to what you're going through right now and how difficult this is. Mm. And I always remember that. Anytime I'm doing something, I'm like, well, you know what? I'm not getting shot at. I'm yeah. not having to dig fighting holes every single day. Right. You know? And so that for me is really what pushed me into where I am now. I mean, I got, I came back and I wanted to continue my career in the Marine Corps. I wanted to be a drill instructor. I always wanted to be a drill instructor. <laughs> I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> but it was really intimidating because I knew drill instructors worked their ass off. Mm. And I thought to myself, am I capable of doing this? Do I have the work ethic to be able mm. to push myself every single day? Because those guys, they got to be self-motivated. Right. You know, I mean, of course, they're going to get yelled at, but you're not if you're, they're not doing their job, right? But you're not going to join or try to be a drill instructor if you're still shit bag. Mm, yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. And so I told myself, I said, hey, after doing two combat deployments, there's nothing I can't do. So then I signed up and I became a drill instructor. I ended up receiving drill instructor of the quarter. And then I received um, meritorious staff sergeant. I did seven wow. cycles, three senior cycles. And it was one of the most challenging, but also one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. Wow. And so when I was in the Marine Corps, I had the opportunity to be a combat veteran, to serve my country, and then to make new Marines. And, you know, they say the two things we do as Marines is we make Marines and we win battles. I had the opportunity (laughs) to do both. And then, you know, I was ready to to move on and I wanted to uh, pursue other things. So I wanted to get into computer graphics post-production. It was something that I was interested in when I was in high school. So my last year, I was a combat swim instructor at the depot. And when you're a combat swim instructor, you get way more time off than you do as a drill instructor. I remember when I was going through the McQuist course, the instructor said, every time you're swimming, just think time off, time off, time (laughs) off. Because when you complete it, you'll have more time off than if you had a different, um, because when you go, when you're a drill instructor, you do three, you do a uh, time what they call in the trenches, kind of like, you know, what we're doing right now as a drill instructor. And then you have your quota. So you got, you could be a McMap instructor. You could be a McQuist or something like that. And the McQuist, that's the one that everybody wants because they, they get the most amount of time off. So that last year, once I finished up with my day, I would go home and I would work on the computer and I was, I self-taught to learn how to be a computer graphic artist. Wow. Yeah. And once I got out of the Marine Corps, I had a demo reel that I put together. One of my buddies who is in the industry helped me to do that. And we started submitting it at different places. And less than a month after getting out of the Marine Corps, I had a job where I was making uh, $400 a day doing computer graphics, which was pretty good. And I was bad, yeah. excited about it. <laughs> but we live out here in beautiful Southern California. And for me, after being a drill instructor and after being infantry, the transition to sitting at a desk all day, every day was much more difficult than I thought. It wasn't hard as far as the, the actual job. It was what I was missing out on because mm-hmm. I would come outside. I'm like, it's so beautiful. And then I go into the office for 10 hours <laughs> and then I come out and it's nighttime. It's like, I missed that, in, that entire day. And, and one day I was, I was uh, watching Cesar Milan videos and different dog training videos. And uh, that was in between, I was working on a few Apple commercials and with Apple commercials, you have a lot of downtime. So I wasn't not working. I always had my work done, but I had some downtime. So I'm looking at these different dog training videos and somebody comes by and says, you're always talking about dogs. You're always looking at dog videos. Why don't you pursue something with dogs? And I thought about it and I reached out to one of my good friends, Jeff Hankinson, who owns um, Dog Style Inc. in Chicago. And we went to high school together and I hit him up and I said, hey, man, you think I can come down and check out your facility, see what you're doing, see if it's something that I might be interested in. So he invited me down. I went there. I spent about three weeks at his training facility. We filmed a bunch of videos and 
I remember I was helping another one of my friends with their dog and I was putting a collar on the dog and the dog tried to bite my hand. And I didn't move my hand because I knew if I moved my hand away, I would be rewarding a bad behavior. Mm. So I just took the bite. I put the collar on and I was sitting down with Jeff later. And I said, Hey man, I did this. What do you think? And I remember he threw a pen in the air and he goes, you understand this way more than other people. We're not getting any younger. Dude, if you want to be a dog trainer, you should pursue it. And so again, I thought about it and I looked up a few different options and he told me about the Tom Rose school. And he also told me about Michael Ellis, which I'm a fan of both of those. And the Tom Rose school accepted the GI bill. So I went to the Tom Rose school, packed up, went to the Tom Rose school and worked all day, every day. I ended up becoming an instructor at that school and we had a two thirds failure rate. Two thirds of the people that signed up would not graduate. And that's because Tom Rose said, I am not going to give out certificates. You have to prove that you are capable of training dogs. You can't just pass one written test and I'm going to give you the, the certificate. No, you have to prove you can do it. So the ones that didn't train, they wouldn't graduate. Mm. And I would tell the students when they came in, I said, in order to graduate and in order to become a good dog trainer, you're not training one dog, you're learning a skill set. So you need to train all day. So we would train from 10 a.m. or 9 a.m. rather till around 10 p.m. at night. And the ones that worked and trained that entire time, those are the ones that graduated and those are the ones out doing really awesome things. Yeah. I know I'm, I'm answering your question in a very long-winded way. <laughs> well, you're answering all of them. I love it, man. I love it. But it sounds like, you know, to me, what I'm hearing, and I want any ambitious vet that's watching this live or on replay um, or even on the podcast, wherever you're at, is like, think about it. You know, he went from, you know, shitbag Shomer to building confidence with small wins that ultimately built up to other things in psychology we call that broad and build theory mm -hmm. you know as you continue to create small wins in your life it actually creates more re you know positive cognitive resources for you to think creatively yes. and it, it just sounds like you know nate did a great job as far as like you know finding a few guys that like you know believed in him and just like you know kind of like climbed up climbed up the mountain from there and uh just found the next challenge the next challenge and the next challenge so wherever you're at in your life if you're considered a ship bag in your little fire team or your social network or whatever you know find those few people that believe in you and find the next challenge and tackle it like uh you know like nate here so yeah, i love that you said that too with the wins i remember yeah. someone came up to me once and he said if you can give a piece one piece of advice to a future generation what would it be and it was pretty much that find things that you're going to do, start with small wins. And once you start it, do not stop until you complete it. Because the, the more you complete, the That's more good. your confidence increases and the more you're able to do. We are based off of what we believe in ourselves. Mm. And I'll tell you this right now. It's much better to be, you know, fill in the blank with your name. It's much better to be shit hot, whatever your name is, than it is to be shit bag, whatever your name <laughs> it is way better <laughs> yeah and the challenge is bridging that gap man and identifying how do you how do you switch gears and develop the you know the human capital the training the experience so you can actually you know do that man but it sounds like you did a a great job as far as doing the work and i love that um you know that principle that you just hit on i found that whenever i i just did complete work in my life even if it was waking up and um you know making the bed fully Right. It was like doing complete work, creating that small win. I know Lewis House from School of Greatness always talks about his first win in the day is, you know, making his bed. But it does. It creates positive thoughts, new energy, positive energy. Like, here's the first thing done. And then the next thing, morning routine. Get your morning routine done. Do that to entirely, entirely. And then um, from there, just figure out what the next challenge is. And it sounds like you were great at doing that, man. It sounds like you achieved a shit ton in the core. How long did you serve, brother? I spent eight years and it was the best eight years of my life. I absolutely loved it. And people often ask, why did you get out? And I only got out because I wanted to pursue new things. I wanted yeah. to try different things and see what else I could do. And I felt like, you know, I, I, I had a great time. I met a lot of brothers that I still talk to. I mean, we're getting ready to do the 15 year reunion for the Najaf cemetery battle. We're going to be doing a hike for that first battalion, fourth Marines, which wow. was considered the worst fighting scene since Vietnam. And that was right before Operation Phantom Fury. So Operation Phantom Fury, Fallujah was so big that it overshadowed what took place in the job. But that battle in the job was no joke. I don't know if you were there. Were you there? Um, where at again? Najaf Cemetery? No, I wasn't. No. It was it was pretty intense. And we had 
some guys who spent three days in that cemetery and oh, wow. they came back out. I remember seeing them and how beat up they were after spending that time out there. And I only spent, I think, 12 hours in the cemetery. Wow. And that place was incredibly dangerous. So we're getting ready to do that reunion. And that whole story was from, you know, the people that we meet in the Marine Corps, the brothers, and how we still keep in contact and we still yeah. meet up and we still train and we still do all these different things. In fact, again, recently, one of my buddies who I was a drill instructor with is a company first sergeant now in the depot. And I've done two crucible hikes with him and his recruits. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome, man. I mean, you've done a lot with your life, man. Not only have you had, you know, a TV show on the animal planet, um, you know, you've really, you know, went from the bottom to the top as I think that Drake song goes. And it's just like, man, I mean, you constantly look for that next challenge. I know that we were talking about this, this hike that you were doing at the entrenched, um, you know, TV launch party. And I definitely want to be a part of that. Before I ask this next question, I mean, how can, you know, an ambitious vet be a part of that, man? Because that sounds like heroic and glorious, man. So what it is, it's a fundraiser hike that we are doing annually. We did the first one last year for Camis and Canines. And again, Camis and Canines, we focus on helping homeless or transitioning veterans. We rescue dogs. We pair the two together, transforming two lives at once. Wow. And the hike last year, we did it from September 1st through September 11th. And we carried a 50-pound pack. So the 50 pounds represented that a veteran is 50% more likely to commit suicide than those that didn't serve. We hiked 22 miles every single day for the 22 veterans that commit suicide. And then we completed the hike on September 11th because that signifies the new generation of combat veterans from the events that took place that day. Mm. And so every single piece had a reason behind it, just like the military uniform. And this year we're doing it November 1st through November 11th instead of September. We ran into a couple issues on the last few days. It was more difficult for us to get the firefighters to help because they're doing a lot of stuff around that day as well. So uh, November seemed like a better fit for this year, but we'll be hiking. We'll be posting it on our Facebook page, on our Instagram page. page. We're starting at Point Magoo, and we hike all the way down to our sanctuary in Del Zara, California, which is pretty much right next to the border. So it's down by San Diego, but it's a little bit more south. And you know, when you're trying to get a lot of property in Southern California, if you're right next to the beach, we wouldn't have much space. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true, man. I just, I acknowledge you for what you're doing, man, because, you know, it's easy to just settle with the, you know, the impact that you're doing as far as connecting disabled vets with, you know, dogs and healing that process. But not only that, man, but you're constantly looking at how do we you know, create healing in other ways and, you know, create a stepping stone for other brothers that are coming in the next wave and stuff like that. And I just acknowledge you for that, man. It's really, really awesome. Well, I appreciate it. Hey, you're doing some pretty awesome stuff yourself. Starting a podcast too, is difficult. It is not because <laughs> I have one. I haven't filmed an episode in like three months because I, it, everything else is going on. And I'm like, man, this guy's got a lot going on. Yeah, man. I mean, it's, it, you know, this whole thing started with just, you know, what, what is the problem out there and just figuring out kind of like you, man, just figuring out what the problem is and trying, trying to find a way to solve it. And that's, that's where everything starts. Ambitious Fed is just really finding what is that problem? What are people complaining about and where, how can you bring communities together? And that's what Nate has done a really good job with camis and canines with is bring communities. I mean, there's meetups out here that he has dozens of people coming together um, and just talking, real talk, and just empowering one another. And it's really impressive stuff. So tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, camis and canines, what your mission is there, and like where you guys are taking it, Nate. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, you know, I did want to mention something that came up a little bit earlier, and then we changed yeah. up with different, maybe pointers or advice for people. One thing that I learned a lot through this journey, and I'm constantly learning, is not to assume something. You know, starting the dog food, we mentioned that in the very beginning. For the longest time, I wanted to start a dog food company, but I simply assumed that I couldn't do it. Uh -huh. I assumed that I wouldn't have the resources. I assumed that I wouldn't have the ability to get the warehouse to make the food. I just had all these assumptions of how I would fail if I was going to attempt it. And often assumptions is what push us back. We can't assume that we're going to fail, but we also don't want to assume that we're just going to succeed, but we want to be willing to try. I mean, we've all heard the saying, fail forward. Yeah. And I heard you mention this before uh, on the podcast, the four-hour work week by Tim Ferriss. Yeah. 
with the assumption, I, I ended up getting the show Rescue Dog to Super Dog. And it was crazy how it happened because I was reached out twice by two different production companies, one for a show about fat dogs, which they ended up making, but they casted somebody else. And then one where they had a cat expert and a dog expert. And again, I didn't receive that. And, and it was almost, you know, like cry wolf. They would reach out to me. I would respond mm. to them. They would want to do a Skype. We would sit down, we would do the Skype. And then I never heard anything again. Then I received a message about the show Rescue Dog. It's a super dog. And I said, okay, sure, I'll Skype. We sat down. I didn't expect anything from it. They said, they called me up. They said, hey, we really like you. We want to do what's called a sizzle reel. And I said, okay, whatever that is. <laughs> you know? And so I met up with them. We filmed the sizzle reel. And that's basically just an introduction of what the show could be mm. for them to pitch to the different networks. And afterwards, I remember the executive producer, she said, all right, great, brilliant job. If uh, they pick it up, you'll hear from us. If not, You'll never hear from us again. And I said, <laughs> great, right? No problem. Two weeks later, they called me and they said, congratulations, you have a show on Animal Planet. Mm. And I was instantly, you know, blown away. I can't believe this yeah. is happening, right? Right. Then I assumed, this is again where assumptions can, can harm you. I was, at the time, I was really trying to grow my social media so I could have more of an impact. And once I got the show, I stopped focusing on the social media because I just assumed that, mm. oh, I'm going to be on a show. I'm going to have thousands and thousands of followers right. right away. So that pushed me back, that assumption. And then we also assume, oh, okay, now I'm going to be super rich because I'm going to be on a show. Everybody thinks people that are on TV shows are super rich. It's not the case with reality, <laughs> not reality TV shows. And I was staying at, if you watch the show, we film at this beautiful house and I rented out a section of the house during the filming. And then I was running into a few issues with the property manager. I didn't like where he was going. He was trying to get a lot of money from me for the dog stuff. And I said, you know what? I'm out of here. Mm. And I didn't have anywhere to go at the time because I had seven dogs. And it's hard to get a lease on a piece of property when you have seven dogs. And yeah. I was fortunate enough that one of my buddies had a place in Lebec. And he was flipping the house in a sense. And he goes, you can stay in the shed in the back. It was like the guest house. But it was basically a shed because it didn't have any insulation or anything. And I went out there and I set everything up and that was actually where I started to develop the on-season canine nutrition. Cause so I'm like, well, I'm here. I have some downtime. I couldn't leave during the day cause I wasn't going to leave the dogs. And so I started working on that and I read the book, the four hour work week mm -hmm. by Tim Ferriss. And as I was reading it, I remember a certain section where he said, you'd be surprised at how easy it is to accomplish things that may seem difficult. Mm -hmm. And I started looking into it and then, you know, lo and behold, a year later, we're releasing our first batch of on-season canine nutrition. So one of the biggest things is that assumption. Don't just assume it's going to work, but don't also assume you're going to fail. Mm. And, uh, and I kind of went a different direction there with Ooh, the question. No, man, that's a that's what we call golden grenade alert here, man. Um, no, I love it, man. I love your passion. I love your intensity, man. I love that you didn't conform to the you know civilian world and just like narrow down that intensity, man, because it, it, it is infectious. So I love that whole assumption um, concept, man, because I think we, you know, I think even on the flip side, of that is expectation, man. Anytime you're just expecting things to happen, you're setting yourself up for, you know, disempowerment, you know, frustration and stuff like that. Anytime you're, you're like that, I mean, you get stuck in life, business, career, yeah. or whatever, man. And I just, I love how you, and it's, this is a trend throughout this whole conversation, but you've just found a way to maximize the fat in your day or your life or something like that. What, what is this other passion project? What do I got to do? And always adapting and overcoming like Marines are known for brother. And um, it's just, it's absolutely amazing. I mean, what would you want an ambitious vet that is stuck, that is assuming right now in life, what would you tell him to give up that assuming and what, what would be some practical tips you'd give him? Beautiful. Uh, what's really good to do and what's helped me quite a bit, and I'm sure it's helped you, is really coming up with a plan. If you mm. think about a maze, take the most complicated maze, what's the best way to figure out the maze? You go backwards. Mm. So if you don't know where you're going to be in five years or 10 years, all roads will lead you there. You have to have a goal of where you want to be and then breaking that goal down. And I know it sounds very basic, but sometimes the most basic things is what wins the match. I mean, look at, you know, Ronda Rousey arm bar and everyone when she was in her prime. <laughs> basic arm bar, right? But it's the basics that really help us. And with that being said, um, having a plan, I lost my train of thought. I had something else I was going to say. So no, man, Sorry, that's, that's good though. 
That's good, brother. I can fuel off that. So it's just like, man, I mean, if if you got a plan, a primary aim, and we just put this in our August newsletter too, which is a great topic, is a primary aim and just reverse engineering it and figuring out what are the smaller steps? What are those small wins? Like tactics, right? They always yeah. say strategy before tactics. Well, know your primary aim before you figure out the tactics. So, I mean, I would just ask you, how do you identify the tactics, man? Because people get stuck on that kind of stuff. That's Yeah, great. Exactly. And that was what I was going to say. So yeah. you brought it right back to me. Beautiful. Yeah. When we are doing something and we are starting a plan, we also want to make sure that we have a good qualified team to work with. That's a big part of it as well. Someone else that can help keep you motivated, help keep you on the same mission. But for me, one of my biggest difficulties when I was getting out of the Marine Corps was always having this sense of need to do something. I have mm-hmm. to move. I have to. I cannot stop. It's yeah. like it's around me, I'm constantly moving. If I sit down to watch TV during the day, I get anxiety. I yeah. just get anxiety. Yeah. I'm like, I have to do something. When I was overseas, I had to do something. When I was a drill instructor, there's never a moment you're not doing something. And that followed me when I got out. And if I don't come up with a clear plan of what I need to do, then I find myself doing a lot of busy work where it's not really doing anything to help my progression. It's just Mm -hmm. busy work. So the plan will really help prevent that, especially for the guys out there who are like me, who are like you, where we can't sit still. We have to do something. So having a plan will also reduce that anxiety by a great bit because I know a lot of veterans struggle with anxiety. And I know this from camis and canines. A lot of the guys that come in, they have issues with anxiety. They don't even know why they're anxious. Yeah. And they're struggling with it. Yeah. That plan's a big part. What do you think has them not know where that anxiety comes from? You know, it happens with me often where I'll, I'll have anxiety and I try to pinpoint where it's coming from and I'm unable to pinpoint. I don't know yeah. what's causing the anxiety and what helps yeah. me is just going back to my plan. What do I need to do? Get my mind focused on the mission and work towards it. And then, of course, if we're yeah. looking at other things, you know, it, it also what we I know this isn't a nutrition or fitness podcast, you know, but what we put in our body is going to affect our mind. What we do. I mean, I tell everybody, if you can, if you have the time and you can afford an extra 150 a month, go sign up at jujitsu. It's mm. probably one of the best things I've ever done. The jujitsu is so good. It, it gives me that clear focus. It gives me a great workout. It builds camaraderie, you know, because it's that concept in the military, shared misery builds camaraderie. Yeah. You know, training with the guys yeah. in jujitsu kind of, for me, it gives me that, that, that brotherhood again and that military feeling. And I think a lot of guys, if they work on their diet, they have some sort of exercise routine and they plan what they're going to do. They have a clear plan and an end goal. Then the anxiety does start to subside a little bit. Yeah, no, I love that, brother, because, um, you know, one thing I do on a weekly basis, I go to the UFC gym down in Mission Valley, San Diego, and I do I do boxing classes, man. Um, I, I, I have never been a good roller. Um, but I mean, boxing, I got I got some good educated hands. So I do that, man. I just brother, it just puts me in a good fighting spirit, man, because I wake up with a lot of self-doubt, man. That's my biggest thing that stops me. I wake up scared, like pretty much just scared of the world, pretty much is the best way you describe it. And I do some Tony Robbins meditation and I go to the gym and I do some boxing classes. And before you know it, I'm like in this flow, the zone that I'm just like, okay, got it. I got this, man. So definitely can relate to getting into the ring, you know, with other guys and just bonding. And, um, you know, the E-Myth, um, I think the author of that book is Gerber. Yeah, you're talking about, yeah. I, yeah. I read E-Myth Revised. I forget the name of the author, though. Michael Gerber, I think. If you, Ambitious, if you're watching this live or on replay, put the, put the name below. I mean, we don't always know everything, right? And it's just like the last chapter of that book, you know, he talks about the dojo effect in business and how, like, you know, when you're, it's just like something about being in a dojo where you're dealing with your fears head on. And I think that when you're, 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 you're putting yourself in jiu-jitsu, boxing, or in a combative, you know, environment, uh, if you're a male, female, whatever, whatever your choice is, I feel like you're dealing with your fears head on. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, definitely. And it does make you more humble as well, which sometimes oh, we need God. to do. Yeah. <laughs> Going back to that too, I was talking to, at the gym that I train at, we have a UFC fighter who teaches there. And I was talking with him the other day and I said, how do you do it, man? How do you, when you're standing in that locker room and you're getting ready to walk out into that octagon and you have all those people yelling and cheering, I mean, the anxiety has got to be absolutely insane. And, you know, I've done competitions in jujitsu at the bottom, bottom level. 
And the amount of anxiety that I had each match that I went into was through the roof. And I said, so how do you do it? And he says, dude, I've done jujitsu competitions too. And those gave me just as much anxiety and much self doubt as the UFC fights that I did. Yeah. You just have to go into it because you have to realize the other person has just as much self doubt and anxiety and nervousness as well. We all go through it, but yeah. it's facing that and pushing through, you know, and uh, I remember somebody once said that they visualized who they wanted to be. You know, I mean, think about anybody, think about Dwayne Johnson. Let's use him. Everybody loves Dwayne Johnson. Yeah. It's probably incredibly difficult to be him because of how much he works, how much time he puts into everything, what time he's getting up. He's always doing projects. That's not easy. But if you want to be someone like the rock, you have to realize that you do have the strength to be able to do that. And he probably has self-doubts just like everybody else. But once you feel those self-doubts, another great book that I read, which I highly recommend, feel the fear and do it anyways. Mm. Everybody feels the fear. If you're afraid of doing a presentation, do it anyways. If you're afraid to get on a podcast, do it anyways. If you're afraid to compete, do it anyways. If you're afraid to start that business, do it anyways, because a year from now, you will wish you started today. Come on, man. Well, the next challenge is becoming a motivational speaker, man. I, I don't know if you already do that, man, but I'm getting all juiced up over here. That's <laughs> that's good stuff, man. I mean, so like we have a tradition here, man. We're, we're hitting to a close on the show, but I mean, what are three golden grenades that you would drop down? Simple golden grenades that an ambitious vet right now could take immediate action on, on creating more influence, wealth, or impact in their life. Yeah, how much time do we have? I know I love talking, so this is a Yeah, man. I mean, we, we're a little couple minutes over. We'll go for a couple more, though. Okay, well, real quick, people can look up, of course, camis and canines. I know you want to talk a little bit more about that, but yeah. you know, really to simplify it, veterans that are struggling, whether they're homeless. So even if you're homeless or if you're struggling with alcohol or drug abuse or anything like that and you want to fix yourself, we have a six-month program. It's been mm-hmm. proven successful, but it's also a very self-motivated program. These guys had to be ready to get in there and work. And then we also do the canine training as well, rescuing dogs. Of course, the on-season canine nutrition, and then I have the dog training videos. But going to what you said, I wrote down a couple things. One we already hit was the, the making a plan. That was a big one for me. Have a plan, not just a daily plan, but a year plan, a five-year plan, a 10-year plan, and work towards that. Also, don't be afraid to stop something, though, if it's not working for you. Yeah. You are doing something, and you realize the passion that you thought was there is not there anymore. <laughs> People get stuck in that as well. They go, I've been doing this for six years. I can't stop now, but they're sick of it. They don't want to do it anymore. Sometimes you have to be willing to do that as well, just like I did with the, the uh, computer graphics. You know, I had a good career with that, but I said, this isn't, this isn't fulfilling me. I have to do mm-hmm. something don't assume you're going to do something or don't assume something's going to happen one way or another. That was another big one. And then for me, the right team, the right team is probably one of the most important things. I had a huge fall a few times from working with the wrong people. Uh, I worked with this one guy and I found out down the road, he was ripping people off Mm. and that in that caused so many issues. So finding the right team, so finding the right team could, could shoot you up through the roof. Be cautious of the wrong team though because the wrong team can harm you. So finding the right team, incredibly important. And the way you can do that is often, you know, we want to go with our gut. A lot of times, if you have a gut feeling, people underestimate the, the power of the gut feeling. Yeah. If you have a bad gut about something, dig into it a little bit more, see what's causing that feeling. Yeah. You know, if you have a good connection with somebody as well, and if you're going to work well together, and sometimes you have to mm-hmm. feel it out, work together for a little while before you actually jump in and set up a business. But for me, those were three really big elements. Yeah, that's awesome, bro. I mean, the, the, those are some great golden grenades. And Ambitious Fat, if you're watching this right now, what was the one gold grenade that Nate just landed right here that you're going to implement in your life, career, business, tomorrow, right now, whenever you want to do it, right? So, guys, here you go. Nate, I mean, where, where can people go and, uh, you know, find you, man? How can people go and find uh, Kimmy's and Canines, your nutritional food company, and also your online, you know, dog training stuff that you're doing, man? I mean, you're doing everything. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah. We have the Kimmy's and Canines website. We have two. We have Kimmy's and Canines.com, Kimmy's and Canines Sanctuary.org. We have the Facebook page. If you type in Kimmy's and Canines, it'll come up as well as the Instagram. I have my Nate Shomer Instagram and Nate Shomer Facebook as well. I'm constantly posting training videos on my Nate Shomer. I don't use it as a page to post photos of me eating a meal to show you how good my dinner is. Every single video or everything that I post relates to dogs. 
So, you know, how to train your dog to do this, how to deal with aggression, how to deal with, you know, fill in the blank. And then I have nateshomer.com. From there, you can find everything that I do, though. nateshomer.com leads to the nateshomerdogtraining.com. It leads to the on-season canine nutrition. It leads to cameras and canines. I put everything there so it was in one central location. But, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> it's good they got a hub, man, to go catch up with everything that you're doing. An ambitious vet, if you're listening to this or watching this, I – I, I just, my marching orders is go and connect with this man. I mean, this guy is doing a lot of great things. He's been featured on Animal Planet, had his own show, um, you know, launched his own physical product, is doing a huge social impact thing out here in San Diego nationwide. And also this hike coming up in November, guys, I just encourage you guys to reach out to guys like him that's always looking for the next challenge. And uh, these, these are guys that you want to be surrounding yourself with in the trenches as you are becoming more as an ambitious vet. So Nate Schomer, man, I just want to thank you, man, for one being a Marine Corps brother that has gotten out, not narrowed your intensity as a Marine and really getting out there, man, and just making a massive impact, man. You've inspired me and I'm sure you've inspired a shit ton of ambitious vets that are going to listen and watch this. Hey, Chris, I really appreciate it. It's been an honor talking with you and you're doing some amazing things too. So this was super awesome. The time flew by like that and I'm excited to see what is to come. Awesome, man. Well, I'm excited to be in the trenches with you. Well, there you have the Ambitious Vet, episode number 62 of the Ambitious Vet with Nate Schomer. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. You could tell we had a lot of on-screen and just conversational chemistry. The man is absolutely a powerhouse and high performer. I definitely encourage you to connect with him. So, Ambitious Vet, if you're listening to this, you are probably a few years out who has discovered that, you know, just your free resources got your first job and you solved that first problem of stability. You figured out that actually getting your first job isn't actually that hard to do. However, the hardest thing there is to do is actually start figuring out what matters most to you. Getting a more fulfilling career and feeling that passion in your heart and actually creating effective, efficient, and skillful results in every area of your life. I'm even talking about your communication with your partner. Um, you know, just even, you know, other areas of life that we don't actually manage, like fun and adventure. Sometimes we can get so razor focused on accomplishing that mission that we forget about fun and adventure, our relationships that increase the quality of your life. If that sounds like you. I want you to allow us to provide the frameworks, expertise, and direction on accelerating your impact post military. Simply just go to vettrainingcoaching.com to create the clarity, the peace of mind, and ultimately just the confidence you need to ask you on what next mission fulfills your heart, your mind, and ultimately where you want to go. If you haven't already, subscribe, rate, review the podcast. Feedback as well allows anything to improve on in life. We want to improve in the trenches right beside you. So let's get better together. Sound good? Lastly, if you're listening to this, we already know that you're warrior made. But to achieve that passion-driven life, utilize just one golden grenade. As Nate just said in this interview, go get that one win. Build that confidence. I promise you, before you know it, you'll be living that meaningful life. Let's go get it.